Hello, I am Joel Bloom at New Jersey Institute of Technology. We pride ourselves on being part of the Newark community and its advancements in technology, the economy, and the growth of the city. That's why we are very proud to partner with the Caucus Educational Corporation to produce Newark at the Crossroads right here on the NGIT campus. We hope you enjoy this special series. Funding for this special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato at NJIT has been provided by NJIT, New Jersey Institute of Technology, TD Bank, The Fidelco Group, United Airlines, Verizon Communications, The Northward Center, and by PSE&G, committed to improving New Jersey's economy and strengthening its communities. Promotional support provided by NJ Biz, All Business, All New Jersey, and by New Jersey Monthly. The magazine of the Garden State, available at newsstands. This is One on One. When you first heard that they were doing Charlie Rose and Gail King, didn't you go, what? People like laughing at others, so I don't mind if the other is me. See, you go right into the character. That's what it is. <laughs> I'm bringing families together a half an hour each week. Man, I'm doing something special. And so I do feel successful. Hi, I'm Steve Adubato. We are at NJIT. This is one-on-one, -on -one, Newark at a Crossroads. We are pleased to welcome our good friend, Chris Cerf, who is the superintendent of the Newark Public Schools, former commissioner of education in the state. I don't think I'd ever, I didn't think I was going to ever say this, superintendent of Newark Public Schools. Why? First of all, thanks so much for having me. It's a great pleasure to be with you uh, again. Well, I believe in uh, the work. I, uh, Newark is a city on the rise. It's led by a great mayor. Um, and I think that uh, together we can build a truly great uh, school system. We, there's been a lot of work uh, done. There's been a little bit of controversy you may uh, bit. have noticed. Cammie Anderson was there um, just last summer. We're doing this in August of 2015. Last summer she was sitting there talking and she was um, a superintendent, she's not there any longer. How are things going to be different? Well, uh, there will be some things that are different and some things that uh, will stay the same. How but, will things improve, put it that way? Well, let me tell you what I believe in and what I'm committed to. I am committed uh, to, first and foremost, to uh, working with the mayor uh, and the board and the community to craft a path to local control. Um, secondly, I am committed to a dialogue that is organized around a central value, and that is let's make sure that every decision we make is based on what is in the best interests of children. I know that the, the dialogue has gotten away from us on all sides a little bit. I'm hoping that we can find common ground around that uh, value. Third, I'm very committed to openness and transparency. Um, what's essentially happened, Steve, is that two narratives have developed uh, in Newark. Um, there are those uh, that view this as a narrative of failure and those who I think view this as a narrative of progress. And What's your narrative? I think everybody's entitled to their own opinion, but not to their own set of facts. And until we can agree on what the facts are here, we're not going to be able to move forward together to build a great school system. I believe a lot of progress has been made. I believe that the team that has been what hard areas? work. Where, where, where has there been progress made? By the way, to put things in perspective, when, when, when Chris Cerf talks about uh, local control, that re that's reference to the fact that since 1995, the New York Public Schools have been run by the state of New Jersey. The state, because of the state constitution of 1947, it is a state responsibility. The state took over the public schools. Local control means moving the schools back from the state to the local government. Progress, where specifically? Well, there's been progress in a number of different ways. Uh, first of all, the, uh, the graduation rate is improved uh, considerably, and that's probably the most important statistic of all. High school? A high school graduation okay. rate. Uh, it's gone from the mid-50s, uh, up into the into the mid 60s, uh, uh, the uh, percentage of students who are graduating from high school, having passed what our exit exam here in the state called the HESPA, uh, has gone gone up uh, significantly. There's been some very important work in professional development. Uh, we have a uh, world class uh, contract with our teachers union. That Can you stay on that. Why is that a world class contract? What makes it that? Well, in a number of different ways. Uh, first and foremost, it starts with the premise that everyone agrees on that a great teacher 
is the most important thing we can do for, uh, for our children. It says that uh, teachers who are great should be rewarded for their greatness. Um, it says that uh, teachers should not automatically move up the compensation uh, schedule uh, mm. unless um, they have proven themselves to be at least uh, uh, effective. And you don't see these things in contracts uh, uh, across the country. I had a uh, tremendously strong working relationship uh, with uh, the union leadership when I was involved uh, in this several, several years ago. You know, it's interesting, the whole question of tying teacher pay to student performance. How do you see it? Well, first of all, I think we need to respect the fact that teachers are the hardest working public servants uh, in the country and in the city. And I don't think anybody goes to work every day as a teacher and says, I'm going to work harder or I'm going to work better if I, uh, if, I get, if, if I get paid more. But I also think that we need to recognize that, um, that when a teacher does give a truly exemplary performance, even if it's only for symbolic reasons, it's important mm. to recognize that and to celebrate that. I also think that the traditional compensation system we've had in schools, which is uh, basically scheduled step raises every, every year Based of additional Based on seniority? Service, yes, every year of additional services leads to an automatic compensation. Is, is not the right way to go. The right way to go is to say, so long as you are on track and continue to be effective or highly effective, you ought to go up. And by the way, I wish we pay, were able to pay our teachers uh, more. We gave a lot of very substantial raises in the contract, uh, uh, by the way. So I think that's a more sensible way to proceed than to simply say everybody is on a path and everybody is moving along that path equally regardless of how uh, students are learning. But the other side to that, and Chris, um, as commissioner, you and I have had very interesting conversations, particularly with my colleague on Capitol Report, Raphael P. Roman mm -hmm. on public television. And we talked about how difficult it is to get teachers who are not performing well out of the classroom. In the city of Newark, um, a significant number of teachers are quote unquote unassigned. Mm -hmm. Tell me if my math is wrong. You've done that before. No, that's correct. Well, let me, let me, let me, let me, well, let me give you the numbers okay. and tell me if it's wrong. 453 unassigned teachers. That's 15% of all the Newark Public School teachers are unassigned. <clears throat> Our math says that that costs about $35 million. Unassigned, what does that mean? Well, uh, here's, what, <clears throat> here's what's going on and here's what's happening. First of all, sure. that number has been cut nearly in half. Um, so, uh, in Meaning the, they're assigned? They are assigned. <clears throat> or by the, when the music stops by the beginning of the school year, they will be assigned. So uh, it, one of the things that our team has been working very, very hard on is to bring that number down dramatically. And to their credit, not mine, they've made a great deal of progress. Uh, but Steve, I think it's important to start with the sort of rock and the hard place we're in. We want our schools to be great schools. We want our schools to be led by great principles. And most of them are, by the way. Um, but we all know that the real action is in the classroom, right? And the really great schools in this country and in the city are those where everybody is pulling the oar in the same direction. There's a culture of achievement. Um, to say to a principal, or to a faculty for that matter, that you must take a particular teacher, even if you don't think the chemistry is right or that person doesn't have what it takes to help the team be successful, that's a pretty big ask, to hold people accountable for results and say that they don't get to choose who, sure. their, who their colleagues are. So the value reflected in this pool that you're referring to is the right value. We don't want to force schools to take teachers. By the way, it's not good for the teachers either. At the same time, we have a, a financial consequence to deal with. So we have crafted a system um, that uh, tries to protect that value as much as possible, mm. but is also realistic about the fiscal constraints. In an effort not to get too inside, mm -hmm. and again, you're a policy person, you're a, a visionary, but the, the idea of quote unquote one Newark, and again, our audience is in many, many states, and so they might have heard of one Newark, it probably didn't, mm -hmm. I haven't heard of it. One Newark is an initiative that, that changes a lot of things about the Newark public schools, about the way it's set up, and, and, and where kids will be going to school, and, and where they can go, um, and shutting some schools down. And a lot of controversy, was built around that and Cammie Anderson sat there and she talked about it and stood up and stood strong for it and, and Ros Barak and others made it clear they didn't like it. Without getting into the, the minutia of it, is that a major piece of your agenda or do you say that was that agenda? 
here's how I think about it. We have to get away from the words and the brand, and we have to focus on what we believe in. And what the name is. I spend a lot of time talking to parents, um, a lot of time talking to parents want? and teachers. What do they want, Chris? Here's what they want. First of all, um, politics aside, they want to make sure that every public school in Newark is a great school. They are indifferent to whether that school is a magnet school, uh, like arts or science, uh, whether it's a traditional public school, whether it's a charter school, whether it's a voca county vocational school. No, what they care about is that their choice is respected, that the choice is fair, nobody's advantaged in that, and that every school is a, a, a great school. So I do believe in that. I also believe that, that um, equity is really important. This equity. Whole, ec what I mean by that is you don't want to allow schools to um, not take their fair share of kids uh, with the greatest level of needs. Um, you want to make sure that there are no games played and who gets access to the great schools in Newark. And also you want to make sure that, um, that, that parents are given the choice about where their kid goes to school. One of the great forms of, uh, one of the great disservices, I think, is when policymakers go, we have this sort of abstract idea about what's right for people, and we know what's right for the system, right? Look, I have three children. I know you uh, have your share. We talk uh, a lot about our kids and, we and do. Their, their education. We do. Um, and um, it, when someone says to you, says, well, I know better than you what's right for your kids, I'm sure it would make you a little cranky. That's right. Um, and so I am very much a believer in saying that all parents should be asked what they want for their kids and the degree to which we can honor that choice, mm. we ought to do that. Now look, it's important to also understand that some schools are oversubscribed. Um, meaning? Meaning there are, there's a <coughs> supply and demand uh, disequilibrium, that there are more uh, applicants for that school than there are places in the school. And we have a law, by the way, that says for pre-K, you can't have more than 15 students in a classroom. So when schools are oversubscribed, not everybody's going to be able to get their choice honored. So what, we, what I do believe in and what I know parents believe in is that you have neutral, fair rules. For example, we want to uh, give what's called sibling preference in this world. Sibling preference. Now, what I mean by that is that if you already have a child in a school and you have a second child coming along, you want to give a preference for that open slot to a parent who already has a child. Because in the it school. would be an inconvenience if that those kids right. were split up. Exactly. They're going off to work. They don't <coughs> want to go to multiple, multiple different campuses to right. drop their kids off. So, how do you prioritize sibling preference over, for example, neighborhood preference? How do you prioritize sibling preference? over, um, we want to make sure that all schools have uh, an appropriate level of support for special education. These are hard policy calls. But, but Chris, what mm -hmm. I'm curious about this is with the community trust issue being what it is, mm -hmm. with the level of vitriol and uh, a lot of the protests that were there. And, and again, Cammie Anderson mm -hmm. stood up, she dealt with it. Um, she did not, at a certain point, she stopped going to certain meetings, mm -hmm. um, public meetings. And when I asked her about it, she said she was not going to be abused or, or bullied, and that was her choice. But there was a reaction to that on the part of many in the community. How do you see yourself in terms of putting yourself out there in this city? There's a reason why it's called Brick City. It's a tough city on a lot of levels. Mm -hmm. Putting yourself out there in a position to be criticized and have those questions and the criticism head on. So I am very committed to engagement, to involvement. I've got a pretty thick skin. Um, I am not comparing myself to my predecessor or anyone else, but I will tell you that I have come to this position with the stated commitment, which I'm already <clears throat> acting on in the first four weeks I've been there, to reach out, to listen, to engage with parents, with elected officials, with the school advisory board, with the mayor uh, and with, with his staff. Um, I am, I believe that a critical part of the future success of the New York public school system is to have an open dialogue uh, around the central value of how do we make decisions in the best interest of children. Uh, you've been in many leadership positions over the years. I don't need to ask you this. Uh, the most important leadership lesson you've learned to date is? You can't have an ego in this business. 
What? Uh, this is New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, you get to a certain point in life and a certain age, and you realize that uh, a lot of things are going to get said, and a lot of people have a lot of different uh, agendas. You have to have a belief system and a set of convictions that you believe in. But more importantly than even that is to realize that often you're wrong. And that people around you, um, whether they're in the community or whether they're colleagues or uh, public servants or parents and so on, you have to be able to listen carefully to what they have to say. Now, listening and agreeing are not always the same thing, and that's often confused. Uh, but you have to be able to listen, change, and adapt. Chris Cerf um, used to head up the state uh, public schools, all the schools in the state. Now he heads up the public schools in Newark, and either way, it's a tough job, and you always come and answer the questions. Thank you, Chris. Appreciate it. Stay Thanks right there. so much. Really appreciate you having me. To see more one on one with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD, and follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. We are honored to have our friend Guy Sterling, the author of a uh, very important book. It's called The Famous, The Familiar, and The Forgotten, 350 Notable Newarkers. Good to see you. Thanks for having me, Steve. Um, and it is an honor. You've been uh, one of the great journalists and authors. Uh, connected to uh, New Jersey and the city for a long time. Thank you. Um, why this book? Well, I thought it w I would tie it into the city's 350th anniversary in, in 2016. And, you know, as uh, a longtime Newarker, and, you know, you're a Newarker yourself, you know that we like to think that everybody passed through here at some point. That's right. And, and to some extent, they have. So I thought I would research that. I love the research. I'm researching every day. I figured, okay, let's find out who really lived here. Let's who find out who is a Norker. And we all can come up with a dozen off the top of our head. But um, once you start to dig, you find out some really, really amazing people going back many, many years. Want to do the famous real quick? Uh, Georgette, run me through this because we have some pictures we're going to put up. Uh, Thomas Edison, go, Nork. Thomas Edison lived here from 1870 to 1875, essentially learned how to become an inventor in Newark, uh, married a Newark girl, his first wife was from Newark, from Newark went to Menlo Park and then to West Orange. Um, you know, the, oh, I'm going to jump, how about this, not just famous, mobsters, a whole bunch of them in here, Richie the Boot Boyardo is in here, but also Jerry Katina. Yes, Jerry Katina. Why is Jerry Katina relevant? Jerry Katina was the boss of a major crime family in the United States, and that's one thing that uh, Newark do didn't, doesn't and didn't have a lot of. Major name, not a well-known name, uh, but a major name in organized crime. There's another name that, uh, Georgette, you don't have this one, but it's one of my all-time favorites, Longhees Woman. Longhees Woman, Norker, uh, very important mobster. Uh, why? Well, Longhees Wilman was essentially the head of the, the, uh, the Jewish mob and uh, was a Norker, a very famous Norker, well-known at the time. Um, story goes that Gene Harlow was one of his girlfriends. I don't know if that's true, but I'm not going to dispute it. Um, sat in on all the major decisions that were made <coughs> in his day. And one of the first names here that I see, it's interesting because my, uh, my dad was thrilled that he was in the book, but his picture is not here. This is not my dad. My dad's over here. But this guy is infamous. Yes, he in is. In city history, this is U.J. Adonisio, the mayor of Newark from what years? Ended in 70. We know that. <laughs> yeah. Um, by the way, excuse me, my cough. Uh, yeah, because he served from 1962 to 1970. He served the United States Congress with Congressman Peter Rodino. Rodino and or they were considering whether it was Rodino where Adonisio was going to be the mayor, and who am I talking about was considering whether they wanted to support one or the other. Who am I talking about? Mob Ken guys. Uh, oh, mob guys. Mob guys were considering who they thought would be the mayor, and they picked U.J. Adonisio. Yes. And why did Adonisio say he wanted to leave Congress? Because, <laughs> because Nork was where the money was. That, I'm not, this is real. <laughs> he said, I can't make any money in Congress, and he sure as heck did make money, and what happened to him in the end? Yeah, he went to jail for being connected to the mob and, and cutting some deals with the mob. Francis Day. Francis Who's Day is Francis a fascinating Day? story. Francis Day was a cabaret <coughs> singer, worked at Prudential. 
was seen by a uh, producer in uh, New York City, said, come to England, I can make a star out of you. Took her there in the 30s and 40s, became one of England's biggest stars on the stage and screen, and at the end of her life, when she couldn't be Frances Day anymore and really wasn't appearing, uh, took another name, totally denied who she was, died in total obscurity to the point where not one obituary appeared on her in an English newspaper. I'll tell you, watch how we jump around here. Whitney Houston. Whitney Houston. Yes. Well, Whitney lived here a short time. Was she uh, otherwise from East Orange or no? Yes, yes. But her, her, the house is no longer there. I went to right. see if it was. It's not. But, you know, uh, was born and lived in Newark for a short time before the family moved to East Orange. But the family, you know, her parents, uh, John and uh, Sissy, you know, had been in Newark before that. So Sissy's in the book as well. How would you do this research? <laughs> you got to dig. How, how much did you dig? Two years of my life. 16-hour days, uh, microfilm in the library. I, Steve, be honest, there were times when I would come home at the end of the day and my head was just going like this from following microfilm on the screen. Digging, books, census reports, city directories. Um, arrest records? Arrest records, For mob yes. Guys. Well, Criminals. yes, absolutely. Jerry Katina's uh, record, his rap sheet, was in the Newark News morgue that is on microfilm at the Newark Public Library. And I thought, one of the things that I insisted on for myself in this book that it was if I couldn't get your address, I, you wouldn't be in my book. I want people to be able to look at this book in, in the anniversary year and use it to go back and see where people lived. I'm not going to tell you every house was there, but Newark does have an older housing stock, and a lot of the houses are there. I've been to a fair number of them. And um, so I wanted to get address. I couldn't come up with an address for Jerry Katina. Now, later on in his life, he lived in South Orange. That, you know, that's kind of well known, but I needed to come up with an address for him in Newark, and it's on his rap. Well, you know, Guy Sterling did this, too. He came up with addresses, and, and Georgette, I don't know if the pictures are here. I do know there is a picture of, is it Jerry Lewis's house? His apartment house. His apartment house. Joe Pesci's house. Talk about Joe Pesci. Well, I actually talked to the owner of the house when Joe Pesci lived there and told me they knew him in the neighborhood as Little Joey. Um, large house out in a corner in the North Ward. Um, That's my neighborhood. Yeah, yeah. And then he moved over, believe it or not, I thought he lived over in Belleville. He, he moved did. Over to Belleville. He, he did. Yes, moved to Belleville, but yeah, Norker. Which is like the suburbs to us. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's an inside joke. Uh, how about this one? Philip Roth, the great Philip Roth. Yes, Philip Roth lived at a couple places in Newark, not far from the high school where he went, Weequake High School. The day we went out to take a picture of his house, there was a worker um, getting the place ready to rent. There was a for rent sign in the house. It does have a historic marker on the front of it. And we asked the guy if he would, like, go inside the house so we could take the photo of the house without anybody in. And he said, <laughs> no, you've got to wait till I'm done. So we waited till he was done. We took the photo. And... Uh, uh, Phillips Roth House is, is there and uh, presumably rented now and someone's living in it. Our, our young boys, uh, Chris and Nick, were fascinated by this one. Shaq. Shaquille O'Neal, Norker, Brick City, go ahead. Absolutely. Well, lived here for um, you know, 12, 13, 14 years of his life. Maintains very strong ties to the city. Uh, has Came back and raised a ton of money for the Boys and Girls Clubs of Newark. Absolutely. Very got active. a lot of help. Go ahead, very I'm sorry. active in, uh, in, in Newark. Likes to come back, likes to, you know, see his friends here. Uh, has hired some people from Newark to be uh, on his team and uh, considers himself a Newarker. Ooh, what about Still one of the great performers? Here. Say it again? Still has relatives here. What about oh, uh, Queen? Queen, Queen Latifah. Latifah. Wonderful lady. Wonderful lady. How, how, did, did you, why do you say that? Do you, do you know anything about her? She allowed me to put her uh, photograph on the cover of my book. Talk about her. It's not something you can just do, but multi-talented, um, you know, a singer, an actress, uh, civic-minded. Again, another person maybe more associated with uh, East Orange uh, or Irvington than, um, than Newark, but, you know, started here. We're proud of her Newark roots. Very much so. One of the other guys on the uh, cover is this gentleman right here. As a little kid growing up in Newark, this guy right here yes. is in our house many times because my dad was very actively involved in politics and civic affairs and supported this guy for mayor in 1970. Ken Gibson became the first black mayor of a uh, city on the eastern seaboard. Mayor Gibson, Ken Gibson, why is he important? Well, that for one reason. Also, the first African-American mayor of Newark served four terms. Um, a major figure in Newark history, no question about it. Uh, made a difference. Still alive, uh, still living in a house that he's been in for many years. A terrific guy. Interesting guy. 
You know, some of Newark mayors, including Ken Gibson and Sharp James. Yes. Legal problems. UJ Adonisio. Yeah. Indictments. Yeah. Part of the city's history. Uh, unfortunately, yeah. Uh, I don't know how you get around it. Um, sad to think, because there's really no reason for it. But um, it's almost like there's something in the water. There's something. And we have, by the way, Newark has the greatest water ever. Connect Newark water to the breweries. Ah, uh, Newark had so many breweries, uh, particularly when the, and when the Germans came. Uh, 20, 30, 40 breweries at a time. The uh, Kruger Brewery, Godfrey Kruger, major figure in Newark history. I, don't, I think he's underrated. I think mm. he's someone who deserves much more study. Uh, his uh, mansion that he built up on the corner of Court Street and King Boulevard is still there, unfortunately abandoned. It's my mm. hope someday will be restored. Um, Hensler's, Ballantine's, uh, Fegenspan's. Uh, Newark was a beer city, and it was made a beer city by the Germans who love the water here and uh, you know, took advantage of it. We have Ballantine or a Budweiser left, and that's it. But the hope is maybe someday someone will come back and uh, you know, restart that business. Um, it's a fascinating book. Newark is celebrating its 350th anniversary in 2016. Yes. Um, listen, other notables, I was listed here. I, 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 my father made it clear to me that he was one of the 350. I was not, he made it clear to me. No, don't, don't even try to explain it, guy. It's okay. It's all right. Um, I thought you might try, but okay. Well, I, listen, I'm, I'm going to include you in the, in the 400th anniversary. You're going to be in there. You, we'll, we'll, we'll what do you have, 8,000 names in there? We'll, re, we'll replace you with your dad. <laughs> I did, however, find your, find your address in the phone book. So you were listed. Did you, was yes. it also listed I made the Hall of Fame in my high school? You had that in there? Uh, probably, You don't yeah. even remember that. No. Um, hey, listen, this is a fascinating book. And for all folk, folks, whether you're Newarkers or want to know more about Newark, this is the book. Guy Sterling is the author, the famous, the familiar, and the forgotten. 350 notable Norkers. This is good stuff. Guy, congratulations. Thanks for having You've me, You've done Steve. a great public service to all of us, particularly those of us who are aficionados of the city. Thank you very much. You're very job. kind. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato at NJIT has been provided by NJIT, TD Bank, The Fidelco Group, United Airlines, Verizon Communications, The Northward Center, and by PSE&G. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. One on One with Steve Adubato at NJIT has been produced in cooperation with Fios One News. Hi, I'm Eric. You might see me as an ordinary person, but I've been living with a brain injury for nearly two years. One of my struggles is short-term memory loss. At Opportunity Project, I'm given hope and support, and I've gained my comments back through the job placement program. Despite my challenges, I have a reason to keep improving. Today, even though life has changed me, I believe that anything is possible. If you have a brain injury, you don't have to face your road to recovery alone. 